All right. Um, thank you once again, everyone, for joining. And uh, we are very happy to uh, present this webinar on uh, APIs and business models for uh, Sri Lankan banks. Uh, we hope to talk about the various benefits uh, of APIs um, and the business models that they can be used in and also provide a real world guide uh, so that it um, really uh, helps folks understand uh, how banks, uh, how local banks can benefit from an API based um, model. Uh, we are presenting this um, webinar uh, along with VSIS. Uh, let me first uh, introduce myself. I'm Seshika Fernando. I'm the Vice President and Head of the BFSI practice at WSO2. Uh, and co-presenting with me from VSIS is Nadira. Uh, Nadira, I'll just um, hand over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Sheshi. So actually, thanks for the quick intro. Uh, as Shashi said, uh, we'll be having a joint webinar and uh, VSI is, is a, a part of that uh, in implementing WSU2 solutions. Actually, as two local companies, we are very proud to host this webinar for the BFSI sector. And I hope this will give insights for you to define your digital transformation strategy in time to come. And I think especially in the time of where the industry is disrupted with uh, fintech solutions and very much challenged with the COVID situation. I hope this uh, webinar would uh, provide insight for you to define your strategy and would like to thank you all for finding time from your busy schedules to attend this. Thank you, Sheshi, over to you. Thanks, Nadir. All right, so without further ado, uh, let's get on with the content we have today. Uh, we want to start with the basics. Um, there's no point in talking about API-based business models without really understanding what an API is and how it can help business. Uh, so let's start with what an API is uh, and why are we using APIs? Uh, so basically, I, um, I always prefer to um, uh, explain the concept of APIs with the famous um, waiter in a restaurant uh, analogy. Um, so usually when you go to a restaurant, um, basically, you know, you, you want to have a meal and uh, you take a look at the menu and then you decide all the things that you want to um, have in your meal, uh, including the appetizer and the main meal and the dessert and uh, the type of wine you want or whatever. Uh, and essentially what you do is you basically um, talk to a waiter and you give your order to a waiter. Uh, and the waiter basically deals with uh, the various teams in the kitchen staff uh, and uh, maybe uh, you know, um, other parts of the restaurant as well, like, like the wine cellar, for example. And uh, the waiter delivers you what you ordered uh, in the order and format that you ordered it. Um, to you uh, on, on, on your demand. So basically in the technology in the systems world, uh, the API is like a waiter. Uh, basically when you require uh, some sort of uh, business process or some sort of data uh, from a collection of systems, uh, you basically turn to an API uh, and you provide um, um, information about what you want, uh, the order and format uh, that you want it, uh, and uh, how you want it uh, served to you. Uh, and the API basically collects that information and, and whatever that you wanted from the internal systems and delivers it to you in that order and format, um, and, and most importantly, very securely. So I think this uh, example would help us in understanding the rest of the uh, webinar as well. Um, and uh, these APIs basically um, give us that access that we require from um, uh, um, a wide range of internal systems that we cannot or do not want to access individually and separately. Um, it gives us access to accurate data uh, on demand and by the right people. All right. Um, so what is the main value uh, that an API adds. Now, if you go back to that whole explanation, 
I think it's very easy to understand. Um, if you took off the waiter from a restaurant and you had to um, go and deal with the individual, you know, the, the head chef and the pastry chef and the uh, wine connoisseur separately and then explain the order and try and get it, uh, you know, the appetizer first, the main meal second uh, and all of that, that would be quite a mess. Uh, so the API does the same thing in the technology world. Um, it basically uh, reduces uh, manual processes, it reduces uh, redundancies, uh, and it provides a great and flexible experience to the consumer. So in doing that, it basically cut costs and helps you grow your business. Uh, it provides faster and cheaper workflows. Uh, it obviously increases agility because the number of integrations uh, and um, uh, the number of uh, interactions that you have to have with various systems is minimized and it provides uh, 10x customer experience. Right, so what does a good API look like? So first of all, the API should work. Um, what does that mean? I mean, that's quite obvious, but um, uh, an API that works should um, achieve the business goals that you set uh, for that system or for that process. Um, basically, when we, when we create an API environment or an API strategy, we are looking to um, fulfill some sort of business strategy or some business goals. So uh, a good API is one that enables us, the bank, to achieve that business goal. If you have the most technically accurate, secure, uh, fantastic, high-performance API, but it doesn't really contribute to your business growth or your business goal, uh, then it's not really a good API. So a good API should be all of those things, but also, most importantly, it should enable the bank uh, or the organization to achieve their goals. Uh, secondly, um, uh, uh, a good API uh, should be flexible, reliable, and easy to use. Uh, what that means is that um, these APIs obviously will be used by a variety of API consumers for a variety of requirements. Uh, so the, uh, a single API should enable uh, the consumers easy access for the consumers, as well as it should enable for the bank um, to easily adapt uh, their business uh, to cater to various um, evolving demands, internal and external demands. Uh, for example, if we take an open banking use case, we know that open banking has been um, um, uh, trending globally. Um, and uh, we also know that in, in regions where open banking is regulated, there are technical standards that need to be followed. And these technical standards continue to evolve uh, very frequently. Um, so API should enable the bank to evolve with those uh, changing requirements and changing uh, external um, um, activities uh, so that it's very easy for them to adapt their business accordingly. Uh, and lastly, uh, an API should be interoperable uh, and secure. Um, obviously, especially for a bank, uh, this is really important that an API is secure because um, for obvious reasons, we are working with very sensitive, um, trusted information and the relationships that has been built by the bank with their customers over so many years uh, should not be at stake uh, because of the uh, quality and robustness of an API. Uh, so we recommend that API should follow open standards uh, and there are many that um, contribute to great API programs uh, like OAuth 2 or FAPI uh, or SIBA. There are various um, open standards that not just make it very secure, but also interoperable. Because when APIs follow open standards, it's very easy for consumers, API consumers, to connect them with various other systems. All right, so uh, let's um, take a, a quick look 
at how APIs have been used in the banking business so that it kind of gives us uh, an understanding of uh, a real world understanding of how this works. Right, so I want to start with an Indian bank. Karnataka Bank is um, the 12th largest bank in India. Um, and um, they basically, they were, um, they've, they've been around for a long time uh, and they wanted to increase their digital banking presence. Their main challenge was, uh, as with many uh, ve very mature banks, uh, is that over the years, they have um, collected so many different uh, legacy systems and they were, they were in silos. So um, there were, it was very difficult for the bank to um, make use of these various systems as a comprehensive um, uh, set of technology. Uh, and there were a lot of manual processes involved in trying to um, download data from one system and upload into another, and then you know trying to filter out data and all of these things. So in a bid to increase their digital banking presence, uh, what they first did is that they um, introduced an API-led integration layer uh, so that um, data and services from these various systems could be exposed robustly, efficiently, and securely. And this layer of APIs then made it very easy uh, for them to um, uh, build standardized services and enable that digital banking presence. So that's a really um, great example of API-led digital transformation. Um, Another example is BDO Bank in Philippines, um, obviously uh, a, a very well-known bank, um, the largest uh, in Philippines and one of the largest in Southeast Asia as well. Um, they also had a similar issue, but they had their business processes were very slow uh, and it also prevented internal collaboration. Uh, that is, you know, systems that were in various silos and systems that were operated by various different departments of the bank couldn't be accessed by other departments uh, in order to make more value. Uh, and uh, there was no um, way to share data securely. So once again, what they did was they um, uh, introduced a integrated API platform so that that connected these various systems securely and with those connections, they were able to enable better customer experiences. Uh, there, there was a need of providing real-time payment capability through um, a new payments app. And that wasn't, they weren't able to do that because that, uh, that real-time data was not available to be accessed in the first place. And secondly, it was very difficult to connect various systems to provide this together. So uh, the API-led integration platform, once again, uh, enabled them to provide that service to customers. And that obviously helped them um, expand their customer base even further. And of course, reaffirm their position as the largest and best bank in Philippines. Um, and another example is Wells Fargo in, in, in the US. Uh, obviously, again, a Fortune 500 company. I believe it's the fourth largest bank in the US. Um, they already had uh, an API program, but they really wanted to build on that capability and extend their API program, especially to um, external partners. Um, and while they had a good API program that was used internally, they didn't have uh, the right portals and the right features that enable them to onboard external parties and help them um, enable them to use these services and data securely. So they really created a marketplace using um, technology uh, where they were able to expose their data and services to third parties and those third parties could build um, more value added functionality uh, on top of those uh, services exposed as APIs. <clears throat> and uh, because of that, uh, the third parties then were able to take the bank's functionality or their products and services to a much wider range of 
um, customers. Uh, and that really increased the number of channels that they were using to take their products to market. Uh, so these are some very um, uh, simple, but very effective use cases or case studies that have used API, uh, API management technology to uh, build their banking business. <laughs> right, so now that we have uh, an idea of how this works in real life, let's really get into the, uh, the meat of the things. Um, so there are various stages of API adoption, even in these examples that I mentioned, you would have seen that certain banks were using it for internal um, uh, optimization of efficiency and certain others were using it for um, collaboration with external parties. So there are various stages of API adoption based on where you are as a bank uh, and based on your digital strategy. So I would just like to very quickly take you through these various stages uh, and explain uh, how it works. So we're going to talk about three main stages and then within those stages we'll talk about different um, sub stages. Um, so the three main stages we're going to talk about is the internal use of APIs uh, and then secondly the external use of APIs with existing with your existing partner network uh, and then thirdly the external uh, use of APIs with new partner network. All right so if we talk about um, the internal use uh, one of the ways that uh, is commonly um, APIs commonly add value is to improve workflow. Uh, so this is really in automating internal processes uh, where, um, for example, data uh, is um, siloed in various, uh, various systems uh, to have access to that data um, to help automate internal processes that are currently manual. Uh, like, for example, automating uh, a credit decision process um, or a data collection process. Uh, and um, you will see an example that I have given to share KYC across products. And I think in the local context, this is very relevant, not just in the local context, I think globally, uh, sharing KYC um, has you know, really increased efficiencies um, in um, you know, product adoption, customer adoption, etc. So APIs actually can reduce redundant processes where, you know, in the current times in, in many local banks, we still have to fill as customers, we still have to fill a KYC every time we open a new time of a uh, new type of product. Uh, so this can really reduce that redundant processes and provide a, a great experience. Uh, and uh, also to create better value uh, through the use of functions that can improve existing processes. Uh, so for example, to use APIs uh, across portfolios uh, to optimize credit decisions. So that's workflow improvement. Um, and then the other one uh, that can be used within internal usage itself is to expand customer channels. Now, uh, usually, uh, various, you know, a bank would have various customer channels, uh, like their online banking portal or their mobile banking application, uh, or their kiosks or their ATMs, etc. Uh, and these will be connected to various internal systems to provide those uh, services to customers. But if there is a proper API uh, platform that is connecting these internal systems uh, with the customer channels, it becomes that much easier to um, expand that uh, set of channels and to introduce new channels very easily because all the um, data and services that are required to be provided through a channel is now available as APIs. Uh, it also provides a seamless omni-channel experience because it is the same API that will be used from these different channels. So wherever you, which, whichever ch um, customer channel that you use to access the bank's products and services will give you the same uh, look and feel and experience. All right, so the next one is external use with existing partners. Now we know that um, there are a lot of 
um, existing partners that a bank already works with. Like I've put some examples like stockbrokers, uh, bank insurance, foreign exchange dealers, uh, and many other partners that um, work uh, very closely with the bank to provide services, value-added services to their existing retail and corporate clients. <clears throat> um, so presently, um, many of these partners require data and services from the bank in order to provide that value add. Uh, and most times these are still manual processes. So, um, and there's a lot of data sharing that happens between these parties. Uh, so APIs can actually automate a lot of these things and streamline this data sharing and automate this data sharing so that um, the human intervention for um, uh, creating this relationship uh, is reduced and the human intervention is uh, you know is is can be focused on you know providing a bit of service uh, and things that can be automated like data sharing are automated and provided in a secure manner uh, reducing the time you uh, use for redundant form filling and things like that uh, it also offers, it, it also can offer new services and options to existing partners so that they collaborate better and they can add even more value beyond um, what they're doing today uh, to enable value for the end consumer. Um, and then um, we also want to talk about, um, within existing partners, we also want to talk about large corporate customers. Uh, obviously, the relationships that banks have with large corporate customers is very different to their relationship with, you know, retail clients. Um, and uh, there is a lot of, um, once again, there's a lot of data that is shared um, and there's a relation, a daily relationship uh, that, um, that enables the bank to provide, you know, things like uh, working capital or different types of loans. Uh, to these customers, and obviously these large corporate customers bring in a lot of revenue for the for the bank. So APIs can actually help streamline some of those common financial tasks. Once again, um, you know, reduce or eliminate redundant processes, uh, provide better um, data, uh, and also uh, make use of data that the bank has collected over the years. Uh, with various transactions for better decision making, especially in providing facilities to the bank, to the corporate customers. Right. So, what about this um, ecosystem? Uh, that uh, ecosystem of external part uh, partners. That um, especially the if you take a look at the local banking sector. Uh, we don't quite have a really great relationship with the banks and the uh, completely external partners like fintechs, etc. have very um, sort of rigid or minimal um, interactions. Um, so before we talk about how APIs can help in those situations, I thought it's good to talk about how this ecosystem is now changing. Um, this is a, is a graph taken from The Economist which shows how this um, whole market share is changing over the, over the last few years. Uh, if you see in the last five to six years, uh, the, the, the market share uh, that banks, global banks have uh, in, uh, in, in this ecosystem has reduced greatly. And what's more alarming is um, the trend line, which is going, you know, which, where the fintechs and the payment firms are really eating into this um, capital market cap. Um, but the reality, if you really think about it, is that um, irrespective of how much big tech and fintech are going to come into this ecosystem, they won't, they won't eat banks completely. Um, they will eat into uh, the market capitalization and the um, and and the business, but the banks that do collaborate with these fintechs, and the banks that adapt uh, to this new ecosystem play, will remain, and they will uh, be a large part of this uh, this entire ecosystem. 
So in that spirit, we want to talk about how APIs enable that type of collaboration uh, with these ecosystem players, with these other ecosystem players. So we want to talk about this as two, uh, two sections or two stages again. Um, you know, most of the time these, these kind of ecosystem players are referred to as fintechs. Um, and we've seen globally how fintechs can really um, exponentially expand a bank's business while um, achieving their own business goals. So in dealing with uh, these fintechs, we believe that um, it's good to have private access first to a set of um, a subset of fintechs or ecosystem players where a bank um, is very free to um, try out new data and services um, through APIs um, and basically innovate new end consumer use cases with uh, those selected uh, select few parties. Uh, this enables the bank to test and optimize services with these trusted partners. So they can be uh, partners who the bank has had a relationship with for a long time, or they have you know, uh, selected them uh, using some very strict criteria based on their technology, technical capability and the understanding of the um, banking, uh, banking ecosystem and basically use those uh, partners to uh, really try out these new ideas through APIs and to really optimize and fine tune these APIs using those partners. Once that is established and once the bank is um, satisfied uh, with the level of value that these APIs are providing to external parties, they can then open that access out into a broader community. Once again, not to just anyone every, and everyone who wants to onboard the bank's developer portal, but um, you can have specific criteria that is automated uh, and enables onboarding partners much faster, uh, and then obviously amplifies a bank's reach through that broader net. Right, so I think um, I've spoken a lot and uh, there's quite a bit to digest. Uh, so let's uh, basically um, take some time to um, answer a poll. Uh, we'd like to uh, put this poll out with where we want to ask you, which stage do you think your bank is at um, uh, within these stages that we just um, discussed? And I'll give you a little bit of time to um, answer the poll. All right, so um, the results are in and 61% um, of the answers um, uh, basically uh, are in stage two. So that's a majority is in stage two. That's great, I think, because we've got a start with APIs, uh, but also there's you know, a lot more that a bank can do with that. All right. Okay, so I want to quickly talk about um, I want to link these three stages into clear business models uh, so that we understand how banks benefit uh, from each of these stages, from, from uh, adopting APIs for each of these stages. So um, if you take the internal usage of APIs and the workflow improvement um, part specifically, uh, this part basically deals with cutting costs. Um, it, uh, because we are reducing redundant processes and automating internal processes and improving things, etc., it can boost productivity um, and really achieve virtual centralization uh, of uh, systems and data. Uh, and um, using these APIs, it can bolster uh, risk management. Um, when it comes to expanding customer channels, um, it can, uh, from a, from a uh, cost perspective, it can eliminate duplicating infrastructure uh, and you can reduce your engineering resources uh, because APIs can enable you to um, uh, basically add um, channels much faster than if you didn't have them and would require so many engineers to work on these complex integrations. Uh, from a revenue perspective, it can really expand your revenue because you will now um, be able to expand your customer touch points uh, through these you know, uh, new uh, customer channels 
And also you can even uh, consider things like launching a new bank subsidiary, which many others have done. Um, uh, when it comes to external use with existing partners, once again, um, when you provide these uh, automated and streamlined data sharing and new services to your existing partners and suppliers, um, once again, it cuts costs uh, because that means less resources are required and you can outsource more of these non-core activities. Uh, but at the same time, it is also boosting revenue uh, because you're monetizing, you can monetize these new services that you're providing to your existing partners. Um, and you can also sell this banking and technology infrastructure to partners. Um, for large corporate customers, once again, um, similar to uh, the previous one, it's all about cutting costs through streamlining things, but it's also about boosting revenue uh, by again, uh, monetizing new services and introducing new products that, the, uh, that many of the competition is not able to. Um, when we look at um, the business models um, that, um, <laughs> that are relevant to uh, external use with new partners, this is where basically um, the, the, the open banking type of, this is, this is exactly the open banking type of business model here. So in terms of um, first working with private access with a set of trusted partners, uh, it enables you to cut costs by avoiding making costly mistakes. Uh, so you learn from those mistakes, fine tune the API platform, uh, and then take it out to the larger market. Uh, but even within that private access, it can really help you uh, boost revenue uh, by launching more customer-centric services, uh, which brings you new revenue models um, and things like banking as, banking as a platform. When you provide that access to the larger ecosystem, uh, again, fewer resources for partner onboarding and servicing, uh, whereas right now um, we do spend a lot of uh, resources in doing due diligence and onboarding partners, et cetera. So this can be automated. Uh, and obviously it just amplifies your revenue potential um, uh, exponentially uh, by going out with a much larger partner system. Um, so basically we want to just uh, summarize the, some, some of the most popular business goals uh, that can be achieved through APIs. So first of all, obviously, as I mentioned, cut costs and do more. Um, scale new revenue streams by um, providing these APIs, monetizing them, um, and creating new types of uh, revenue models. Um, onboard new customers at scale by exposing these APIs to various other parties who can take those products and services via their um, portals and applications. Um, deliver personalized customer ex experiences by um, using data that are siloed across different uh, systems right now and building comprehensive um, uh, customer profiles and then providing a personalized service to those customers based on those profiles. Uh, and obviously keeping ahead of digital disruption because uh, when you have APIs, that means you have, you have an integrated systems uh, and that can enable you to easily um, um, adapt with uh, you know, changing and evolving internal and external um, requirements. All right, so I think it's uh, good to do another poll. Um, um, basically this one, uh, so we're going to put in um, three priorities, oh, sorry, five priorities. And we would like to understand which of these goals is the highest priority for your bank. I think there's an even split uh, at the moment. Um, and I think uh, a few more uh, answers would, uh, would uh, be the tiebreaker really. We can see that personalized customer experiences is gaining ground. I think that's very important, especially in the Sri Lankan context. 
where banks um, are really competing with each other to provide the, the, the best um, web application or mobile banking application, et cetera. Yeah, I think so. Delivering personalized experiences uh, is the winner. Uh, and I think APIs are a great way to, um, great way to um, enable that. And in close second place was um, new revenue streams. Uh, I think with the global adoption of, uh, you know, open banking and, um, uh, you know, new um, streams of business, um, I think it's catching on in Sri Lanka as well. All right. Okay, so now that we've kind of covered the various business models and um, the various stages and business models and given some ideas, uh, we want to very quickly uh, just talk about, um, you know, give some inspiration from other banks um, uh, who have um, basically used APIs uh, to expand and grow their businesses. Um, this is a very um, clever little um, graphic and graph that we got from the Innerpay Open Banking Monitor. Uh, it basically uh, shows how banks um, are using APIs, um, the, the functional scope of those APIs against the developer experience. And you will see uh, these, you know, sort of these four cells where uh, the best developer experience and, and, and the most rich API scope, uh, the, those banks are being kind of um, referred to as masters in openness. If you go to each of these banks, some of these banks actually, uh, and to their developer portals, uh, you will you will see the amazing uh, things they have done. Um, so I think it's really important that banks concentrate on both these things. Um, sometimes banks can get uh, sort of fixated on the functionality that they are providing through their APIs, but if they don't have a great developer experience, uh, no matter how great the and rich the individual APIs are, uh, they know consumers are going to really come and consume that and make value out of it. Separately, banks could have a great, uh, you know, developer onboarding experience, uh, you know, documentation, tryout facilities and all of that. But if the, if the APIs are of poor quality or they don't provide a lot of functionality, uh, then again, there's um, not much um, take up. So I think the clear winners are those who really focus on both, and you can see uh, how the how the banks are distributed uh, in that sort of uh, line in the middle. Um, and then, what APIs are banks actually building? Um, so, uh, a, a platformable does this. Um, I think quarterly they they graph out. Uh, you know, what types of APIs, and, and this is very clear to see that payments and accounts are the uh, clear leader. Uh, but of course, that is largely because of um, regulated open banking requirements like PSD2 and PSD2 in Europe and Consumer Data Rights in Australia, etc., where payments and accounts uh, APIs are required by this large number of banks to be exposed. But if you, I think, I think the real fun is uh, in identifying the voluntary APIs that banks have exposed. And it's quite interesting to see that KYC and authorization are uh, leading that you know, voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, uh, space, um, as well as um, uh, more uh, common ones like bank products and ATM locations, but also importantly, things like credit scoring and loan pre-approvals. And we'll show you a couple of things that some of the banks have done with these type of APIs and how much they have gained, um, you know, customer adoption and really reputation uh, because of those simple APIs. Before we do that, um, just like to do a one last poll uh, and ask you which API product would you most would you most likely to launch within the next six months.
think the I think uh, the results are very telling of uh, uh, the local ecosystem. Uh, payments are 60% say it's payments. Um, and I think um, even the local fintech ecosystem is a lot catered towards payments. Uh, KYC is in second place. Uh, once again, a, a big requirement, central bank working on KYC uh, and banks really trying to improve that service as well. Um, but I think globally, um, and, and thank you for that, um, globally, I think um, making use of data and providing new better services through that data is also usually a common uh, result that we see um, global points. All right, so I think um, now is a good time to basically um, focus on some of those uh, cool use cases that some of these other banks have done. Um, a regional Australia Bank uh, um, collaborating with this fintech called BASIC. Uh, they basically uh, reduced their time to cash on loans uh, from months to minutes. Um, they, uh, they basically automated their credit decisioning process and um, basically the the, even even the application uh, process. So the applications were filled in under 10 minutes because many of the data that is required were pre-populated by information that the bank already had about that consumer. Um, and they basically, um, I think I remember um, their, 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 their first uh, fully automated uh, loan was uh, assessed, the risk was assessed and the cash actually dispensed in under one and a half hours, in 90 minutes. Um, sometimes locally, um, unfortunately it takes around that much time to even open uh, a general savings account. So, which just involves, it doesn't involve any credit decisioning. So this is really, you know, fantastic timing and, and they have come a long way from there as well. Uh, and I love uh, the quote by the CEO, uh, which uh, who said a perennial absurdity is that SMEs end up scanning their paper bank statements only for the data to be manually re-entered into the underwriting systems of modern online lenders. Um, so he was basically saying that open banking is really making a real difference uh, at the grassroots level. Um, the 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 next um, example is from BBVA, uh, where they basically um, provide transactional data, uh, and they basically improve the business decisions um, uh, and and the knowledge of the customers. So they offer anonymized and aggregated statistical data uh, from millions of transactions performed with BBVA cards, but they've anonymized that. Uh, and they basically, and, and, and those transactions can be from the post terminals uh, or you know, various um, touch points. And they actually create a virtual map uh, uh, which shows consumer habits um, and the uh, breakdown of demographics uh, and origins. So it's really cool and um, getting a lot of new uh, revenue for the bank through this new uh, product. Uh, and I, I think another example from BBVA, BBVA, because BBVA is known as one of those banks who, who, who's really got APIs and open banking right. Um, so again, um, uh, they're basically enabling, um, they're enabling um, third parties to embed uh, their banking and payments into those uh, applications uh, under their own brands. So, uh, a lot of customers using BBVA services, even um, under different other brands. Um, ABN AMRO, uh, once again, creating uh, new revenue streams uh, through a new type of product, which, is, uh, which are their APIs. Uh, so apart from general banking products and services, they are also selling their APIs. Uh, so monetizing their APIs, they have a really rich and really cool um, API platform. You can go and get, uh, check it out. Um, and really uh, making um, 
a new revenue stream out of it through those products. Um, so if you go into the um, uh, developer portal, you will see the various different types of APIs that they have and how they really make it very useful for a third party to consume. <clears throat> All right, so those were some, some of the cool examples we'd seen. And uh, we just wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the lessons that we have learned uh, from our uh, deployments globally uh, with uh, banks in various regions. So first of all, um, <laughs> I think uh, the, the, <laughs> this is the most uh, daunting thing for banks, I think, but also the most obvious thing is that not to be scared to share data. Uh, sometimes it's really difficult for um, banks to really come to terms with this because customer data and transactional data are things that they have guarded, um, jealously guarded over the last so many years because that is where that trust uh, is built between the customer and the, and the bank. But essentially in this new, uh, new um, banking ecosystem, um, data is basically used as uh, the ingredient to grow uh, your uh, products as well as your customer base by sharing that data securely with consumer consent. Uh, and when open banking, um, when you know exposing data uh, to external parties and uh, as part of open banking, uh, sometimes banks get really um, kind of fixated on achieving just open banking compliance, but open banking compliance doesn't always grow your business. Uh, you need to be able to quickly adopt and test new approaches and um, basically expand your API ecosystem to uh, gain from various business models that your competition is not doing. Uh, secondly, when building an API uh, strategy, we want that API, we, we've seen banks who approach it as a business strategy to be the ones that really um, use it for um, revenue growth rather than as an IT strategy. If you allow your IT department to uh, build the API strategy on their own, then it will be just that. It will, it will be something um, that um, optimizes the technology infrastructure, but not necessarily scales the business. So it's really important that technology teams work with business teams to create an API business strategy that can really um, change the way and expand the way you do business. Um, and thirdly, um, get the platform fundamentals right. Uh, in doing API management, get the security layer um, right, uh, get the proper API management tools like you know, trying out features, uh, documentation, easy onboarding, uh, sandbox environment versus production, how you move from sandbox to production and all of those things. Uh, reliability and flexibility are key. So work with platforms that enable you to really be agile in your API strategy. All right, so um, last of all, um, I'd just like to um, give a few examples um, very quickly. Um, I think, I think we spoke about a lot of these things, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time here, but basically APIs enable you to uh, build new customer experiences faster. We've uh, enabled a lot of banks uh, along with our uh, system integration partners to really integrate and leverage their data and services to, uh, and, and business capabilities to basically help them understand their customers better and to launch new products to market faster. Uh, we've done this um, uh, mainly with the WS2 API manager, which enables uh, uh, banks to basically deal with their legacy core and proprietary systems, these different messaging formats, who access to data and things like that, and to basically make use of these standardized messaging formats um, and enable publishing uh, managed APIs uh, that are optimized for performance and security and to really enable banks to get rid of all that uh, complexity and spaghetti architectures to really boost customer experience. Um, if you're looking at open banking and especially in Sri Lanka, uh, open banking is coming in the future uh, as, as, as a regulatory uh, movement. 
um, uh, you know, API management and this open banking technology uh, that revolves around API management and security can really accelerate the compliance, but also enable banks to go much further uh, than compliance to really explore new uh, revenue streams and new co consumer centric use cases. So at WS2, we've enabled a lot of banks to do that through the WS2 open banking solution that is built on top of the WS2 API manager and identity server. Uh, and another example is how um, banks can harness emerging ecosystems uh, to grow their business. Uh, so we've basically um, helped banks create these marketplaces where you help, where you work with API producers, but also API consumers, and you and, and you basically match them, uh, sort of like a matchmaker uh, portal, and enable much more um, value uh, that takes your products and services to a larger group, but also enables uh, different revenue streams for you through API monetization. So uh, that's it. I think we covered a lot of uh, content. Uh, and I think I'd like to uh, open the floor for questions. Um, I think Nadira, over to you to uh, basically manage that. Uh, Nadira, uh, Nadira, I think you'll have to unmute yourself. Hi, Shashi, thanks. Uh, so let's wait for a few questions to come. I think it's the end of the day. and. Uh, people might be in a hurry to leave as well. Let's see. Uh, seems like we don't have any questions at the moment. There's a question whether the recording is available. Yes, the recording is available and uh, we'll be sharing it. Really appreciate. Um, if you could post your questions, if you have any. Um, I, while, while we wait for questions, I just want to um, say that there will be um, a survey run, uh, which will include um, uh, technical overviews, uh, and a deep dive into benefits of CIM in banking uh, and an overview of open banking. These are some topics uh, that uh, we can we can we can do. Um, so um, I think that is running at the moment. Um, so we'd like to understand uh, what you are most interested in, so that we can do uh, a few more webinars or sessions uh, that address your needs. And I'd just like to say that if, if, if you have any technical questions, um, you can ask them as well. So actually, if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact myself or Shish for that matter. So we'll be very much happy to come and meet you, understand your requirements and uh, provide a solution as required for your each and individual needs. So you know VSIS is must be already a partner of yours. Most of the customers in this forum are our customers. So please feel free to contact us and we'll be there to help you with your journey with the WSO2 solutions. I think in terms of the poll, I think uh, um, the majority opted for uh, the uh, a deeper dive into the API platform. So I think that's a good uh, a good trend uh, coming in after this um, session. So obviously there's a lot of interest uh, in how to utilize APIs uh, for better business growth. Uh, Sashi, there's a question. Is open banking available for Sri Lankan banks as well? Um, well, well, yes, of course. Uh, open banking is basically um, uh, it's just it's it's just a concept uh, of um, exposing your uh, products and services via secure APIs to third parties. 
with consumer consent. And yes, it is available for bank, any bank globally, uh, but it is not regulated in Sri Lanka like it is regulated in Europe or Australia or Brazil or any of these countries. So as a result, we don't see a lot of banks. Um, we do see a lot of banks uh, working with uh, third parties, but we don't see them uh, basically um, uh, really focusing on developing their open banking capabilities. But essentially, it is available to anyone, any bank. Thanks. I think as a, as a follow-up to that, I'd just like to mention that there are various uh, technical standards that have been built around open banking globally. And uh, at WS2, we've provided um, uh, compliance to many of those global standards. So those, um, uh, those you know, opening up your APIs to external parties um, in compliance with any of those global standards uh, is available as well if you're um, working with WS2. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. So we can take one more minute and uh, call it a day, I suppose. Uh, I think another way to kind of, uh, if you have a more detailed question that is uh, difficult to be addressed in this session is to um, uh, send, us, uh, send us an email. Uh, Nadira's and my email addresses are on screen right now. Um, we can also always have a conversation with you guys. Uh, so please uh, drop us a line if, um, if, you, if you want to further this uh, discussion on APIs. All right, um, Nadira, I think if there's no more questions, uh, shall we wrap up? Yep, I think good too. All right, so uh, thanks everyone for joining and um, um, basically, um, you know, hanging out, hang, hanging on for the entire thing. Uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us, as I mentioned. Uh, WSB does a lot of work uh, in the API space. We, you know, recognized by global uh, analysts uh, uh, in this area as well. So we'll be very happy to um, uh, basically utilize our global learnings and um, understand with you how we can uh, make them um, relevant in the Sri Lankan context. Um, there is a post webinar survey, um, as I mentioned before, so please, uh, please do fill that. Um, uh, it will be launched in a new window after the webinar. So that's it from me. Uh, Nadira, over to you for any final thoughts. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending and waiting till the end of the webinar. And please feel free to contact us. We would uh, definitely come and meet you in person to take this discussion forward. Thanks again. Have a nice day and stay safe.